Hey y'all. So today we're going to be going back into the book, Women Who Run With the Wolves, and we're going to be in chapter 14 still, um, which is Initiation in the Underground Forest. And today's discussion is going to be about the sixth stage, the realm of the wild woman. And so this one's um, not too long. We're going to actually be able to cover it in this one video. And then after that, um, it'll be time for the seventh stage, the wild bride and bridegroom. So that'll be um, a really good uh, culmination of everything um, all together that we've discussed. So um, this stage is is um, where the maiden in the story, the handless maiden, okay, the, who turns into a queen, right? So the main character in the story. Um, we get to witness her second descent into the underground forest, right? Which is um, just an archetypal metaphor for um, a deep dive um, in uh, another stage of development within the psyche, another peeling away of, um, of a layer of fog, um, another step of awakening however you want to um view this it's um she describes this in relation to the story which again is all metaphor as a descent so the first descent if you remember was when she first left her um parents um home okay because she had been uh you know, dismembered, right? Her hands had been cut off and um, her father offered the riches that had been given to them from the devil through the, uh, the bargain that he made. But she rejected those riches. And so, and you know, I, I love that because in a, lot of, in a lot of ways, when we are in a toxic um, relationship or environment or situation, a group, whatever it is, um, when we walk away, we may be walking away from things that those riches could symbolize, right? So some people may actually choose to stay, um, even to the death, knowing that it's detrimental, it's continually um, and incrementally de detrimental to their health and well-being. Um, it could just be, you know, um, psychologically, or it could be bodily as well. But regardless, um, you know, it's, it's a choice to walk away. And so that's what she does in the story. And so when she walks away in the story the first time, remember she's wandering. Okay. So she's just, you know, left everything that's familiar. She's left everything that she's known. And that's very much like we are when we step away from what's familiar to us, when we recognize it's not good for us. And so she finds the um, the orchard, the pear orchard. So that that's um, symbolic of her first descent, okay? And then while there, uh, that's when she meets the king, right? Who falls in love with her. And they get married. And, um, and then there's another stage of descent or another stage of deepening this understanding of, um, of reality and how it works for us. So that's what this section's about. And it's... Um, I'm going to go ahead and read to you the opening because it, it describes the part in the story. Um, it says, The young queen comes to the largest, wildest forest she's ever seen, and no paths are discernible. She picks her way over and through and around. So this is when we don't have a good grasp on a point of reference because we haven't had enough experience in life. Um, then our minds can't yet register um, what what we're seeing or what we're observing or what we're experiencing, okay? This is why sometimes psychological abuse can go on for a certain period of time because we haven't, it's new to us. We've never experienced it before and we don't have that footing, that, that um, grounding. We're not rooted yet in some deep truths to have to use as a point of reference to, um, for our minds to register what's going on. And so we're wandering, you know, so to speak, in our mind, like we're just kind of floating. We're, we, we may feel that something's off, but we haven't developed that logic to understand and for our minds to calculate and register what that is. So, um, and then I find it interesting that during this, this time here, um, and if you remember, 
this is when the queen, I'm sorry, the king's mother has sent her, the queen, the main character, away for her safety, right, <clears throat> into the forest. So the king is absent during this time, okay? He's not there. And remember, he's symbolic of the gate, gatekeeper of the psyche. So when you view this as, you know, this stage within our own psychic development, um, the gatekeeper is, is when it falls asleep. Because, you know, in the last video, it was um, section, she was talking about how when there's a new concept and we're trying to grasp it, we can easily forget it because it hasn't taken root yet. We haven't taken it down another level of understanding to really get rooted in it and understand it and retain it, retain it. So this gatekeeper symbolized in the story by the king, he has gone off for some time to war in the story. And that's symbolic of, um, you know, we, we went through the first descent, the first awakening, you know, maybe we have stepped away from a toxic relationship or environment, but we kind of need to be careful about engaging out there in the world, um, in the devil's playground, um, until we really get um, a firm grasp on how the darkness operates because otherwise we're vulnerable. So we have these concepts, but we're not able to retain them quite yet. So we have to go into the second descent, um, so to speak. And so that's what happens here um, because the king is, is absent. He's absent. And that gatekeeper part of our mind is, is just turned off. It's silent um, while we while we um, refine the other parts of our psyche because I view this as the gatekeeper needs to function and be active when the other parts of our psyche are still naive and haven't yet been developed when they're still immature. That's when this, this parental figure in the mind, in our psyche, this gatekeeper, the king, has to be really on guard and active. But it's necessary um, to develop all the other parts of our psyche. So this, you know, in a way needs to, to fall asleep or to be silent um, or to go away and be absent so that the rest of the parts of the psyche can develop. Okay, remember, it's like the, the mama wolf um, exposing her wolf pups to hardships um, so that they learn, okay? So it's the same kind of concept here. So that's what's going on when, that's how I view it. <laughs> anyway, what's going on developmentally in the psyche and why this needs to happen. Okay, so, <clears throat> so she's picking her way over and through and around in this, this huge wild forest that she's very unfamiliar with, never, never seen. It says, no paths are discernible. It says, near dark, the same white spirit who helped her at the moat earlier guides her to a poor inn run by kindly woods people. Now, I find it interesting that when this, this gatekeeper goes silent, this spirit returns. So when we're wandering in life, sometimes this is the condition that needs to happen, the experiences we need to go through in order to hear um, a divine guiding uh voice within us, right? In order to connect. It's, it goes back to that Bible, Bible verse, be still and know. So we have to get quiet to be able to hear God's voice. And again, apply your own lens. Feel free. This is just the way I see it. Um, and so in order to reconnect there, things do need to kind of go quiet out here, you know, because ultimately we want that to be our default. That the um, numinous part inside of us, the Holy Spirit, whatever, however you want to call it, that's guiding us on the inside. We want that to be our default at all times. So, so this white spirit guides her to this inn. And there's, there's kindly woods people there, it says. A woman in white bids her enter and calls her by name. When the young queen asks how she knows her name, the woman in white says, we who are of the forest follow these matters, my queen. So the queen stays seven years in the forest inn and is happy with her child and her life. Her hands gradually grow back 
first as little baby hands, then as little girl hands, and finally as woman's hands. Though this episode is the shortest in the tale, it is truly the longest both in time past and in terms of bringing the task to fruition. The maiden has wandered again and comes home, so to speak, for seven years, separated from her husband. It is true, but otherwise experiencing enrichment and restoration. Her state has again aroused the compassion of a spirit in white, now her guiding spirit, and it leads her to this home in the forest. Such is the infinitely merciful nature of the deep psyche during a woman's journey. There is always the next helper and the next. This spirit who leads and shelters her is of the old wild mother, and as such is the instinctual psyche that always knows what comes next and what comes next after that. All right, so then she goes into talking about um, this wild forest being um, an archetypal symbolism, uh, symbol, uh, a sacred archetypal symbol uh, of meaning initiatory ground, okay? And then she references a, a wild forest that the ancient Greeks um, said grew in the underworld called uh, Luce, Luce, L-E-U-C-E, Luce, I don't know, <laughs> you can look it up, um, I, I probably will at some point, this is very intriguing to me, so it was also filled with sacred and ancestral trees, it was full of beasts, both wild and tame, um, and so she goes here in this forest, in the story, and she finds peace for seven years, okay, remember seven is a, a common theme found um, throughout these, um, uh, folklore tales that are very um, laden with meaning, with symbolism for us. So it also calls this, even though it's unfamiliar to her, it's actually her homeland. She's coming home. And uh, it says this is where her flowering soul regains its roots. So remember, we opened this section talking about how we needed to get our footing. We need to get grounded or rooted. This is where this happens symbolically, okay? So it says, and who is the woman in the deep wood who runs the inn? Um, it's just, she says it's symbolic of um, an aspect of the old triple goddess. And that's, again, something you can just take and research if you have interest. So she goes into talking about, you know, how a lot of the old... Um, uh, religions and, and uh, <clears throat> how do I want to say this? The old teaching, um, folklore, and myths, all that's been lost through, over time. Uh, but the, the fragments that are left are potent, they're important. So we can take those fragments of the lessons and, and piece them together enough to still create <coughs> excuse me, stories that are going to teach us, right? Teach our, our youth today. So she says, <coughs> excuse me, um, yeah, what we see are two women over seven years time come to know one another. The spirit in white is like the telepathic Baba Yaga in Vasilisa, who is a representation of the old wild mother. As the Yaga says to Vasilisa, even though she's never seen her before, if you remember that story, right, this old witch in the woods, um, she says, oh, yes, I know your people, to little Vasilisa, um, even though she's never seen her before, right? So this female spirit who is an in innkeeper in the underworld in this story already knows the young queen, for she is also of the sacred wild woman who knows all, okay? Again, the story breaks significantly. The exact tasks and learnings of those seven years are not alluded to, other than to say that they were restful and revivifying, right? Because she's entering this still very inexperienced, and she's being restored and, and getting her roots. All right. So, um, yeah, the core remains constant throughout these stories where women's initiation is in itself an archetype. Um, she says, so here is what we know about initiation from candling other fairy tales and myths, both oral and written. The maiden stays for seven years, for that is the time of a season and of a woman's life. I'm sorry. For that is the time of a season of a woman's life. Seven is the number accorded to the moon cycles, and it is the number of other terms of sacred time, seven days of creation, seven days to a week, and so forth. But beyond these mystical understandings is one far greater, and it is this. 
a woman's life is divided into phases of seven years each. Every seven year period stands for a certain set of experiences and learnings. These phases can be understood concretely as terms of adult development, but they may more so be understood as spiritual stages of development that do not necessarily correspond to a woman's chronological age, although sometimes that is so. Since the beginning of time, women's lives have been divided into phases, most having to do with the changing powers of her body. Sequentializing a woman's physical, spiritual, emotional, and creative life is useful so that she is able to anticipate and prepare for what comes next. And I feel like that's what's missing in our modern society. We don't have rituals. We don't have ceremonies to, um, to bring attention to um, these phases of development to our youth. And I think, you know, if they were prepared and they kind of had some idea of what to expect, I think that, you know, they would be much better off. So I think it's up to us, you know, to implement this within our own family um, and community. So um, it says, <clears throat> Empirical observation of women's unrest, restlessness, yearning, changing, and growing brings the old patterns or faces of women's deep life back to life. Deep life back to light, making it conscious, right? Again, we're just drawing attention to knowing what to expect. Though we can put specific titles to the stages, they are all cycles of completion, aging, dying, and new life. The seven years the maiden spends in the forest are to teach her the detail and dramas connected to these phases. Here are cycles of seven years each, stretching across a woman's entire lifetime. Each has its rights and its tasks. It is up to us to fill them in. So even though this is kind of like a pattern, and that's, that's something really interesting to me that, you know, you can, if you look, if you want to see, you can find patterns all throughout nature patterns it kind of gives you an insight into um, the creator's mind you know the fact that it is intentional create creation that's my belief anyway that creation is intentional it's not haphazard or, or just um, um, out of the blue so <clears throat> yeah so but yeah there's there's patterns and there's like a, a path and yet it's up to us she says to feel them in the tasks so that's that's why i kind of like to think of all this of reality as us being co-creators right um it says these phases are not meant to be tied and exorbitant to chronological age for some women at 80 are still in developmental young maidenhood and some women at age 40 are in the psychic world of the mist beings and some 20 year olds are as battle scarred as long-lived crones the ages are not meant to be hierarchical hierarchical but simply belong to women's consciousness, right? Stages of development of the psyche and to the increase of their soul lives. Each, each age represents a change in attitude, a change in tasking and a change in values. And I would say with regard to her saying a change in values, there's some things that we don't want to change, you know? Um, others that we definitely do, um, like not giving our trust away freely making sure we stay armored up and aware of the darkness that operates in the world and you know that kind of that kind of awareness and intention that we're going to operate with going forward is going to change our values it's going to change you know our priorities even day to day and just how we operate and and engage with people and with circumstances it's just going to change we're not going to be so open and unguarded anymore so now she goes into um, the specifics, and so I'll just kind of touch on these a little bit. So zero to seven years old, it's just um, age of the body and dreaming, socialization, yet retaining imagination. Um, age seven to 14 is an age of separating, yet um, weaving together reason and the imaginal. 14 to 21 is the age of the new body, young maidenhood, um, unfurling yet protecting sensuality. 21 to 28 is age of the new world, new life, and exploring. 28 to 35 is age of the mother, learning to mother others and self. Um, 35 to 42, age of the seeker, learning to mother self and seeking the self. 42 to 49, age of the early crone, finding the far encampment and giving courage to others. 
49 to 56, Age of the Underworld, Learning the Words and Rights. 56 to 63, Age of Choice, Choosing One's World and the Work Yet to Be Done. 63 to 70, uh, Becoming Watchwoman, Recasting All One Has Learned. 70 to 77, Age of Reuthanization, More Chromedom. 77 to 84, Age of the Mist Beings, Finding More Big in the Small. 84 to 91, Age of Weaving with a Scarlet Thread, Understanding the Weaving of Life. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> I'll be so glad when this pollen's gone. <laughs> 91 to 98, Age of the Ethereal, Less to Saying, More to Being. 98 to 105, Age of Numa, The Breath. 105 and up, Age of Timelessness. Yes. So it says, for many women, the first half of these phases of a woman's knowing, say about age 40 to about age 40 or so, clearly moves from the substan substantive body of the instinctual infant realizations to the bodily knowing of the deep mother. So this is where we're starting to understand the grand design of us as human beings, that there is um, a numinous and important connection between all parts of us you know our mind our heart our body we're learning to trust the sensations that arise in our body as you know uh, signals because there's this um, immediate alarm system that goes off before our minds can catch up to it and, and and understand what's going on so it's it's just kind of that synchronization of all parts you know I feel like so the body becomes an internal sensing device she says right um, so she says seven again is the number of initiation and so she just reiterates that talking about all the references throughout the different stories um, and then she says according to ancient teaching the senses represent aspects of soul or the inward holy body um, they are here to be worked and developed and there's seven senses, if you think about it. Seven's everywhere if you're looking for it, right? Um, and she says, therefore, because of the seven senses, there are seven task areas. Animation, feeling, speech, taste, sight, hearing, and smelling. And she says, each sense was said to be under the influence of an energy from the heavens. They're gifts, right? And we can use all these as metaphors, too. Um, and just kind of expand on all of those. And so she goes in... Uh, into some expansion on that. So she says, so in this time of the maiden's learning in the deep woods, there is another miracle. Her hands begin to grow back in phases. Uh, first, that of a baby. We can take this to mean that her understanding of all that has occurred is at first imitative like a baby's. As her hands grow into those of a child, she develops a concrete but not absolute understanding of all things. When finally they become, they become woman's hands, women's hands, she has practiced, she has a, she has a practiced and deeper grasp of the non-concrete, the metaphoric, the sacred path she has been on. Yes, that resonated with me. As we practice the deep, deep instinctive knowing about all manner of things we are learning over a lifetime, our hands return to us. Yes. So we get to a stage after these different levels of descent, right? Where we're developing all these different parts of our mind um, and synchronizing all the parts of us learning to trust the feelings that arise in our body and all this, right? So we're, we're getting psychically prepared is the way I see this. Um, which is qualifying us for different environments. We're now uh, becoming um, more qualified to to be out outside of this forest, the safe haven, okay? Because we're going to know how to be guarded. We're going to know how to operate in a way that we're, you know, we're armored, you know? And so we, again, we have a better grasp on these things. These things that sounded so abstract, you know, like, like being directed in the Bible to um, to be girded with with the armor, you know, and you're just you have these images of a sword and a shield, but really you're like, what does that mean? So it's just getting a better grasp on that and what that means for you, right? So now we're going to be operating veiled and strategically out in the world with intention and awareness. So. 
we're protected, see? So now this, this um, gatekeeper function of the psyche, the king, isn't having to bear all of this uh, responsibility on his own. Now all these other parts have been strengthened and they're aware and they're on guard, right? So now you're gonna see him return. It's all a process. <laughs> we're all a work in process, right? All of us. So it says, this too is a powerful metaphor for the idea of saving the child self. Okay, let me back up. So here she's she's um, talking about a different version of this tale that she's aware of where um, it says, um, the young queen goes to a well and as she bends over to draw water, her child falls into the well. It says the young queen begins to shriek and a spirit appears and asks, why, did, why does she not rescue her child? And she says, because I have no hands, right? <clears throat> But the spirit tells her to try anyway. So she reaches her arms into the water and to grab her child. And sure enough, right then, her hands regenerate in the moment. And the child is saved. So that's very important for this next part. She says, this too is a powerful metaphor for the idea of saving the child's self. Remember, the child is a result of a marriage here of all these parts. So that's, that's some symbolic, in my opinion, of what is retained. Um, to help us move forward in this world, you know, living in both worlds, <laughs> um, being of, in the world, but not of it, you know, and being awake and aware of this. Um, this too is a powerful metaphor, powerful metaphor for the idea of saving the child self, the soul self from being lost again in the unconscious, right? From letting our guard down, forgetting who we are and what our work is. So we have to always be on guard. It is at this point in our lives that even very charming people, very enchanting ideas, very alluring Calliope, I think I'm saying that right, music, can be turned away with ease, and especially if it does not nurture a woman's union with the wild. For many women, the transformation from feeling oneself swept away or enslaved by every idea or person who raps at her door to being a woman shining with La Destina, possessed of a deep sense of her own destiny is a miraculous one. With eyes on straight, palms outward, with the hearing of the instinctual self intact, the woman goes into life in this new and powerful manner. Right. We're operating differently now. <clears throat> so, um, yes, because our hands help us to sense things, right? Symbolically. It says they are regenerated through the fear of losing the child self, right? In that story um, about the well. So the regeneration of a woman's grasp on her life and work sometimes causes a momentary hiatus in the work for she may not be totally confident of her newfound strengths. She may have to try them out for a time to realize how great their reach is. So it's just firming up, you know, this new awareness we have. Um, since we often have to reform our ideas of once without power or hands, always without power, because we are very disempowered we become disempowered when um excuse me we go through these toxic experiences where we're made to um we're persuaded to not trust ourselves and that's where the disempowerment comes from from a manipulator wanting us to doubt ourselves right so we we unconsciously form this paradigm during those experiences that like she says once without power always without power that's where a person stays in victimhood but we're not going to do that right we're going to do the work to pull ourselves out of this so um yeah it says um after all of our losses and sufferings we find that if we will reach we will be rewarded by grasping the child that is most precious to us this is where a woman feels that at long last she has a grasp of her life again and palms to see with and to fashion life with once more. I was reminded of the story of the red shoes then. Remember the story um, in that story? The child loved her handmade red shoes. That was very symbolic right there that they were handmade by her. And so now we're, we're at that point after going through these processes, these descents to firm up all these parts of our psyche to stay aware and to know what, what matters, you know, to define what our pearls are that we're not going to cast out before the world, that we're only going to keep guarded, um, except for those special um, few that have earned our trust, right? 
in our life. We're going to share our pearls with them because they're, they're our own kind, right? So um, it's like um, making another pair of handmade red shoes is kind of <laughs> what she says. And to fashion, to fashion life with once more with our hands. Yes. All through, she has been helped by interpsychic forces, and she has matured greatly. Yes, she is truly within herself, capital S, self, now. Yes. So that's the end of that section. Um, I really enjoyed it. I hope that I've given you a lot to think about. hope I've inspired you and encouraged you. Um, again, the next section is called the seventh stage, the wild bride and bridegroom. So I'm looking forward to that because the king returns. And um, so it's kind of a happily ever after story, which is always cool. <laughs> so um, thank you for coming along today. And uh, I just hope you enjoyed it. I hope you'll join me again soon. And I hope you have a beautiful day. And I will see you again very soon.